Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Laura Lovers and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of Cure Epilepsy and I want to thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar is entitled Epilepsy with Eyelid Myoclonia, Diagnosis and Treatment of this Rare Photosensitive Epilepsy. Epilepsy with Eyelid Myoclonia or EEM is also commonly referred to as Jevons syndrome. This form of epilepsy is a type of absence epilepsy characterized by a brief but intense and repeated fluttering or jerking of the eyelids. The seizures associated with this type of epilepsy can be triggered by bright and or flickering lights and can be associated with an abnormal EEG pattern. Cure Epilepsy recently convened an international group of experts to address unmet needs regarding the diagnosis and treatment of EEM. This group of experts, led by Drs. Kelsey Smith and Elaine Worrell, used a process called a Modified Delphi Consensus Process to survey experts from around the world to develop a better understanding of the clinical presentation of EEM and establish best practices for its management. This seminar kicks off the second half of the 2023 Cure Epilepsy webinar series, where we highlight some of the critical research that's being done on epilepsy. Today's webinar, like all of our webinars, is being recorded for later viewing on the Cure Epilepsy website and YouTube. You can also download transcripts of all of our webinars for reading. Cure Epilepsy is proud to celebrate our 25th anniversary this year. Since our founding in 1998, we've raised millions of dollars to fund epilepsy research that supports our mission, which is to find a cure for epilepsy by promoting and funding patient-focused research. Cure Epilepsy provides grants that support novel research projects and advance the search for cures and more effective treatments. Today's webinar will help attendees learn how to recognize the clinical features of EEM, as well as how to differentiate it from other epilepsy syndromes. The webinar will also review the consensus first line treatments for EEM. This webinar is presented by Dr. Kelsey Smith, who is an assistant professor of neurology and an ep epileptologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Her clinical and research interests include genetic generalized epilepsy syndromes, such as EEM, autoimmune associated seizure disorders, and women with epilepsy. She's the first author of multiple publications that address the diagnosis and treatment of EEM. Before Dr. Smith begins, I'd like to encourage everyone to ask questions. We'll address the questions during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Keep in mind, you may submit your questions anytime during the presentation by typing them into the Q&A tab located on your WebEx panel and click send. We'll do our very best to get through as many of the questions as we can. We do want this webinar to be as interactive and informative as possible. However, to respect everyone's privacy, we ask that you make your questions general and not specific to a loved one's epilepsy. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Smith. Great, thank you so much. Thank you to Cure Epilepsy and to Laura for you know having me here today. Um, I'm really honored to give this talk today on epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, and we'll discuss the diagnosis and treatment of this rare photosensitive epilepsy syndrome. And as Laura already stated, I'm an assistant professor of neurology and epileptologist at uh, Mayo Clinic, and really excited to be here today to give this this talk to you about this important topic. All right, let's see. I don't think I'm controlling the slides. Sorry. Let's see. Clicked it. Okay. I will take control. Okay. Hopefully this should work. Okay. So just to start off with an acknowledgement and disclosure, kind of as Laura was speaking about, but I have received some research funding from a grant from Cure Epilepsy for a project about this uh, topic specifically that was titled Javon Syndrome, Improving Diagnosis and Treatment Through a Modified Delphi Consensus Process, and I'll discuss some of the results we obtained from this uh, today as well. And so things we'll talk about, we'll talk about the clinical and EEG features of epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. We'll try and differentiate this epilepsy syndrome from other epilepsy syndromes and talk about how it's different and how the outcome may be different. And then we'll also doc, talk about the preferred treatments for epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. And we'll do that through first discussing the clinical features, 
the EEG features as that's a very important part of this diagnosis, the treatment. And then at the end, we'll talk about the results of our international modified Delphi consensus process. So what is epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia? So epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia is a rare generalized epilepsy syndrome. It was first um, described in 1977 by Javans, and so it was known as Javan syndrome for a long time. And then um, the name evolved to eyelid myoclonia with or without absence seizures. And then over time, um, this epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia is the name that's been accepted and has been um, used in the International League Against Epilepsy classification of epilepsy syndromes. Um, and it's a rare epilepsy syndrome, only accounting for about 1.2 to 2.7% of cases of epilepsy. And given its rarity, there's some difficulty with making the diagnosis and a lot of patients are misdiagnosed. In terms of the classification of epilepsy syndromes, the International League Against Epilepsy published updated classifications in 2022, included um, epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia as a genetic generalized epilepsy syndrome that we can see here um, in a few different graphs that they had from their publications. And what we can see is that this is an epilepsy syndrome that is distinct from the idiopathic generalized epilepsy syndromes that are listed here and are, are more common than epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. And then in another paper um, from the same classifications, we see epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia um, falling here with more of an uncertain prognosis as compared to other epilepsy syndromes like childhood absence epilepsy. And these classification papers and making the appropriate epilepsy syndrome diagnosis is very important as it plays a role in prognosis and treatment and in the comorbidities that we see in patients and will be very important as we move forward with the hopes of clinical trial enrollment and things like that. And so today we'll talk about how we differentiate epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia from other epilepsy syndromes. And just a little side note here, is that there's also this very rare epilepsy um, syndrome that's been recognized and studied called sunflower syndrome, where patients actually look up at the sun and usually wave their hands in front of their eyes and will have seizures that may look similar to the seizures seen with epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. While there's some debate about whether this syndrome is similar to epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia or not, um, in the International League Against Epilepsy um, classification papers, it was um, denoted or classified as a subgroup of epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. And so just to mention that. And so how do we diagnose epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia? Well, there's first of all this diagnostic triad. So three things that we really look for that helps us determine if this is epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. And the first thing, which may not come as a surprise given the name of the epilepsy syndrome is eyelid myoclonia. And this eyelid myoclonia is this very intense jerking or twitching of the eyelids where the eyes and the head may actually roll back. And we'll look at some videos of this um, and uh, talk about eyelid myoclonia a little more. Um, and this can be associated with or without loss of awareness. And if patients are losing awareness, then it's defined as being an absence seizure associated with the eyelid myoclonia. Therefore, this is considered to be in some ways an absence epilepsy. And then the other thing that we see is that these eye episodes of eyelid myoclonia or even the abnormalities that we see on EEG start after someone closes their eyes. So by closing the eyes, especially in bright lights, eyelid myoclonia can be induced. And then patients frequently have photosensitivity, and we'll talk about that more as well. And that can be photosensitivity where the seizures are more likely in bright lights or artificial lights, but then also that we can see abnormalities when patients are given photic stimulation on an EEG. And so in terms of epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, who presents with this rare epilepsy syndrome? Well, we define this as a childhood onset epilepsy syndrome, and the average age of diagnosis is six to eight years when their symptoms may start, although as we'll talk about, the diagnosis may be delayed by a long time. But there's a range still all falling usually within childhood of from two to 14 years that patients um, can first start having the seizures. We see that girls are more affected than boys with a female predominance of two to one. 
And I said that this is, you know, this is a genetic generalized epilepsy syndrome. And so we think genetics have a role and we'll talk about that more as well. But family history is common among patients, but it can be a diverse family history of different epilepsy syndromes and not just that epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia runs in the family. Intellectual ability um, in these children, especially before seizure onset, is typically normal. And as I talked, as I stated, there is usually a delayed diagnosis. So seizures um, are an important part of any epilepsy syndrome, and that includes epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. And so eyelid myoclonia is really the main seizure type, and it's required for the diagnosis. A lot of times we can witness this on exam because these seizures can happen multiple times per day, but without eyelid myoclonia, you can't make the diagnosis. But eyelid myoclonia itself isn't unique necessarily to epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia and may be seen in some other epilepsy syndromes. So it's important to take everything into consideration when making a syndromic diagnosis for the appropriate epilepsy syndrome. But most patients have more seizure types than just the eyelid myoclonia, and so they can have absent seizures, and a lot of times that may go with the eyelid myoclonia, but they can have absent seizures without eyelid myoclonia. And then most patients have generalized tonic clonic seizures at some point um, during their course of epilepsy, although typically these are infrequent in an individual patient, although there's definitely a subgroup that may have more frequent generalized tonic clonic seizures. And we may also see seizures like myoclonic seizures where patients can have jerks of their extremities um, associated uh, with abnormalities on EEG. So what is eyelid myoclonia? So it's, like I said, rhythmic jerking of the eyelids where the eyes and the head may be rolling back during these episodes. A lot of times this occurs right after eye closure, uh, typically in bright lights. Um, and it's brief, lasting usually around six seconds or so, um, but can occur multiple times per day, hundreds of times per day even, especially in patients who aren't being treated yet. Um, and this eyelid myoclonia, it may not be recognized as a seizure type right away as, you know, it's not a typical seizure type you'd see in a movie or anything like that. And so um, a lot of times patients aren't appropriately diagnosed as having eyelid myoclonia, and it's frequently misdiagnosed as um, eye movements. Um, I've seen multiple patients who are first referred to an eye doctor in childhood because they think there's dry eyes or another problem with the eyes. The eyelid myoclonia can be mistaken for an eye rolling, a behavior eye rolling, or other kind of behavioral movements. Um, and so it can take some time before these patients are even seen by a neurologist, and sometimes it's not until they have a generalized tonic-clonic seizure that these are then recognized. And so here's some videos um, of eyelid myoclonia. Um, all these videos are used with permission from, from patients. Um, and what you see in this patient here is that when she closes her eyes, she then has this fluttering and eye jerking, eyelid jerking where her eyes also roll back. This patient, I'll play the video one more time, also has myoclonic jerks of her extremities, which we can see sometimes um, associated with the eyelid myoclonia. Uh, and so that's one example there. And I will go to my next video here. Uh, let's see, there it is. And this patient, you see, he closes his eyes and he'll close them again. And then you start to see the eyelids fluttering, the eyes rolling back. And this patient has um, some loss of awareness during this period of time. He stops speaking um, to someone um, and loses track of thought there. And so that's eyelid myoclonia. A lot of times we'll see abnormalities on EEG during this. Um, but as the course of eyelid myoclonia goes on, sometimes we see changes we see the eyelid movements without changes on EEG as well. And certain triggers have been identified and photic stimulation, like I said, is a, um, photosensitivity is part of the triad for the diagnosis. And then eye closure is when we a lot of times see the onset of the eyelid myoclonia or changes on EEG. 
And it's not only thought that maybe it's just eye closure itself that causes the seizures, but it may actually be elimination of central fixation of the eyes, which can be artificially done with different lenses and things like that. There's some debate in the literature about this though. And then as in with many epilepsy syndrome, stress or sleep deprivation can provoke seizures in these patients. There's been some reports of self-induction where it could be from such as with the sunflower syndrome where they look up at the sun and wave their hands in front of their eyes with the seizures. But this is another area of debate as well as um, such as in sunflower syndrome, it's felt that that may be part of the semiology or part of the, the seizure itself. And so I think this is still an area that requires further research. And so how do we make the diagnosis of epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia? Well, the clinical history is very important. So a lot of times, um, patients, uh, families, or the patient themselves, they can think back and say, oh, these eye movements have been present for a long time. We just thought it was their normal behavior if it goes unrecognized. The neurologic examination is, is very important as well. The neurologic examination is typically normal with the exception that typically eyelid myoclonia can be witnessed in the exam room, especially if we shine a bright light in the eyes and have them um, close their eyes purposefully. And then an EEG is the other big part to make the diagnosis as we need to see the abnormalities um, that fits with the diagnosis on EEG. And so we'll talk a little bit about the EEG here, um, but not in, in too many details. Um, but and typically when we look at the EEG, um, this slide is talking about the EEG interictally or in between seizures. And there's a typical background frequency in EEGs and the background frequency is typically normal in patients with epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. But we can see that the EEG itself, the background activity looks very sharply contoured as opposed to a normal activity, especially after eye closure, kind of fitting with the whole epilepsy syndrome. And then the changes we see on EEG are, are generalized changes because this is a generalized epilepsy. And so we may see these generalized atypical spike and wave discharges, and these abnormalities can be brought on by eye closure. And then when we use photic stimulation with um, uh, the flashing lights, um, photoparoxysmal response can be typically seen in these patients, especially if they're not currently being treated um, for their epilepsy. And then a lot of times in the EEG lab on a routine EEG, we'll also have patients hyperventilate. And hyperventilation we know can induce seizures, especially in epilepsy syndromes like childhood absence epilepsy. But we also see that in up to 50 to 60% of patients with epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, this may provoke seizures. And then when we look at the EEG during seizures, and we call something ictal, so during the seizure EEG, and we consider the eyelid myoclonia to be at seizure. So during the eyelid myoclonia, we still see the generalized discharges on the EEG. Like I said, a lot of the times this can be induced by eye closure. And since patients can have such frequent events, even in a 45 minute to a 60 minute EEG, it's not uncommon that we can um, capture some of these um, eyelid myoclonia events on the routine EEG, especially when we have them close their eyes and when we use the photoparoxysm, uh, the uh, photic stimulation. And so the photoparoxysmal response is when we're um, giving the flashing lights to patients during the EEG and we can see abnormal abnormalities on the EEG, there's um, extra electricity on the EEG associated with the increased risk of seizures. And like I said, photosensitivity is required for the diagnosis, but we know that photosensitivity in itself decreases with age and decreases with patients who are on anti-seizure medications. And so having um, the lack of the abnorm abnormalities during photic stimulation does not completely rule out this diagnosis, especially in patients on medication. The literature has shown that certain flash frequencies may be the most activating, and a lot of times we can see the eyelid myoclonia if we look closely at the video during um, this flashing lights. 
And it, it's not just in the lab um, that this makes a difference, although it helps make the diagnosis, but it's really that these patients notice this photosensitivity um, in everyday life and will have trouble with their seizures when out in the light, in the sunlight, around artificial lights. And so a lot of times if you just talk to patients, they're noticing this photosensitivity in everyday life. All right, and I just have some screenshots of EEGs just to try and show that uh, these abnormalities um, uh, from patient to patient, once we start seeing these EEGs, look quite similar um, for all the patients who have epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. Um, but on the EEG itself, this area of the EEG here looks pretty normal. The patient's eyes are open. This deflection here is actually artifacts from eye closure. So we can tell by looking at the EEG when someone closes their eyes. And a lot of times after we close eyes, we see that we see more background activity in the back of the head, which is these leads here. And in patients with epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, we see that this activity here is sharper than we would typically see. Um, uh, that arrow there points again to the eye closure. And, and here's more examples um, from different patients as well where we have eye closure and then more sharply contoured activity than we typically see. And then we can see these generalized discharges in between seizures. And so here's generalized polyspike and wave during sleep in a patient. And we see that this is generalized as in it, it's um, showing that most of the brain is involved during this activity. And then here's some examples of actually what the EEG may look like during eyelid myoclonia, where again, the deflection seen on all these leads here is eye closure. So we see the patient closes their eyes. And then over about three seconds, because these lines here are one second, so over three seconds, she had, uh, this patient has abnormal discharges. And actually, when we looked at the video, had the eye movements associated with it. And we can even see some artifact in the area where the leads are closest to the eyes associated with eyelid myoclonia. The patient then later has an eye closure here, which doesn't have any abnormal activity. But then you see later in the page, just a few seconds later, again, eye closure with this brief episode of eyelid myoclonia. Um, and here's just further examples of what sometimes we see on the EEG. Um, these green bars are one second apart. So again, it shows you that this can be very brief activity, this lasting just about a second and a half. And this um, is a longer episode of eyelid myoclonia, but again, after eye closure, and then we see abnormal discharges throughout the whole brain. And then this is the EEG during um, the, the photic stimulation when we're doing the flashing lights. The lines at the bottom show us how fast the flashing lights are going actually. And we see that during the flashing lights, there's this generalized, very sharply contoured activity throughout the whole brain. So a generalized kind of atypical spike and wave, poly spike and wave discharges associated with the flashing lights. Uh, this is another example of during photic stimulation. And sometimes we see that it's not just that very sharp uh, spike in wave activity, but it can be sharply contoured kind of generalized activity at about the flash frequency um, that's given during photic stimulation. And there's been some data out there and studies looking at, at the photoparoxysmal response specifically. And then, let's see. Sorry, it lagged. And um, apologies here. Trying to get this video to play. Oh. I'm not sure if it will play for us. Oh. So I'm not sure that, oh, it looks like you got it to play. Okay, sounds good. So this is uh, the video I showed earlier. So 
when the patient closes his eyes, we can see the eye closure on the EEG and on the video. And then you see that the EEG looks very abnormal, um, where there's just a lot of generalized sharp activity. And so you can see that there's this abnormal EEG change that fits with the eyelid myoclonia in this patient. I thought this was a nice example um, of what we're typically looking for on the EEG. Okay, let's see here. And so a lot of times when we um, diagnose epilepsy, brain imaging is a part of that. Um, for the generalized epilepsy syndromes, the brain imaging is typically normal. And that's the same thing for epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. We think that the brain imaging is usually normal, or if it shows anything, it's mild or nonspecific changes that would be unrelated to the epilepsy. And actually in the International League Against Epilepsy um, classification papers, they said that an MRI is not required for the diagnosis um, of epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. And then I said, this is a genetic generalized epilepsy. So what about the genetics? What's the genetic cause of this? And like I said before, there's a high rate of a positive family history, although that positive family history can be unique. So there may be um, siblings that even have juvenile myoclonic epilepsy or other generalized epilepsy syndromes. But there are cases of epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia and twins as well, suggesting this genetic predisposition or genetic cause. But despite what we know that we think this has an underlying genetic driver or cause, genetic mutations are only rare rarely found in patients. And really over the past few years, so there's been a couple more publications about this and listed here are some of the genes associated with epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. And when a genetic mutation is found, it's usually associated, um, maybe associated with more likely to have um, hard to control epilepsy or intellectual disability as well. I think that um, Genetics is an area that will grow rapidly, I'm hoping, in the years to come, and we should understand further um, uh, the, the role genetics has in this, and there may be further discovered in the future. And then what about comorbidities for these patients? So with any epilepsy syndrome, it's not just seizures itself, but there's a lot of comorbidities we need to we need to talk to patients about and think about. I said, you know, development is usually normal, especially before seizure onset. There's a subgroup of patients who may have intellectual disability or school difficulties, usually in the mild severity range. But we will see that the eyelid myoclonia, especially if patients are losing awareness, may result in school difficulties, or we can't ignore the fact that all of our anti-seizure medications have the potential for side effects and for potential for difficult, uh, leading to further school difficulties. And so this is still a problem for many of our patients with epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. And like um, many epilepsy syndromes and epilepsy in general, anxiety and depression may be present as well. Um, and so it's something to screen for and to talk to our patients about as well. And the rates of anxiety and depression and epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia itself is not well described in the literature, but I think it's likely quite, quite high associated with the, the epilepsy diagnosis and everything. So making the appropriate diagnosis is very important so that we can tell a patient this is your what your diagnosis is, this is what we know about the natural history of this epilepsy syndrome, this is the best way to treat it. Um, but unfortunately for epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, we know the diagnosis may be delayed by many years. And we know that many patients may be misdiagnosed as this eyelid myoclonia is not recognized as a seizure type um, by many. And so how how delayed could the diagnosis be? So um, this data right here so, uh, is from a study I published in uh, 2018 of 30 patients. And in 30 patients, the diagnosis was delayed by an average of 9.6 years. So that's a long time for a person not to have the appropriate diagnosis. And as I'm sure you can imagine, then, you know, although this is a childhood onset epilepsy, we may be seeing patients that are first being diagnosed appropriately in the adult epilepsy clinic if there's such a delay in diagnosis. And I said many may be misdiagnosed. And so 
Um, and a study by Ifra Zawar, who's at University of Virginia, um, and she did this work while she was at Cleveland Clinic, and she helped us a lot with the modified Delphi process over the last year and a half. She did this study of uh, patients with epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, and from their group, they reported that 77% of first had a misdiagnosis, the incorrect diagnosis, and that was most frequently childhood absence epilepsy or juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. And so I still think there's a lot of um, room for improvement and um, a faster diagnosis and an appropriate diagnosis. And so when we have patients who come who could possibly have epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, what other diagnoses are we thinking about? And that's other epilepsy syndromes and most commonly the childhood absence epilepsy and juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. And then we have to think about could these be tics or behavioral eye fluttering and things like that? In these settings, you wouldn't have an abnormal EEG. So this is another area where the EEG can be very helpful. And we put this uh, table together for a publication about epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, um, comparing and contrasting it to two other common epilepsy syndromes, so childhood absence epilepsy and juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. And we can see that you know, especially with the top two, they're both childhood onset epilepsies, um, but there are differences in the length of the absence seizures, um, and obviously the eyelid myoclonia is mostly associated with the epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. We can see some differences on EEG that help us differentiate it, and the reason it's important to differentiate it is because we know that the outcome is quite different between childhood absence epilepsy and epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, and especially as, you know, the hope to have, you know, a, uh, kind of more specific treatments for epilepsy syndromes, we really need to um, appropriately diagnose patients with the right syndrome. And so how do we treat epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia? Well, the, the answer is mostly broad spectrum anti-seizure medications, um, which includes things like valproic acid, levetiracetam, lamotrigine, and other um, benzodiazepines. So anti-seizure kind of medications that work for generalized epilepsies. There are some anti-seizure medications that can make some generalized epilepsies worse, including epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, and so that could be sodium channel blocking medications. And so if the, not, um, the patient doesn't get the appropriate diagnosis and they get placed on one of these medications, it could actually worsen seizure control. Um, that's kind of the main main way we treat patients. Um, there is a special kind of lens therapy because as we talked about, a lot of times patients have this photosensitivity to bright lights. And so there's a special lens therapy um, called the Blue Lens Z1 that's been studied for photosensitive epilepsy. And it's been shown to reduce photosensitivity. Unfortunately, it's not readily available, it can be difficult to get in the United States, um, and also um, it really kind of makes the world dark and blue, and so it can be very um, difficult also for patients to tolerate um, if they are able to get access to the lens therapy. And then in terms of, you know, we've had a some new anti-seizure medications over the last several years, and there's a growth in areas to treat epilepsy other than medicines, such as neuromodulation, like vagus nerve stimulation, responsive neurostimulators, and deep brain stimulation. But given the rarity of this epilepsy syndrome, there's just um, not much published or known about the use of these treatments for epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. There's also um, dietary therapy, um, but again, there's just not much literature out there about how to use these in epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. In terms of the outcome, from what we know from the literature, we know that patients um, may have drug resistance where their seizures may continue um, despite trying more than uh, one anti-seizure medications. Um, and especially the eyelid myoclonia may be difficult to control, while the generalized tonic-clonic seizures may be easier to control with anti-seizure medications. Um, and then we generally think of this as being an epilepsy syndrome, although it starts in childhood, that patients are unlikely to outgrow and that they probably require anti-seizure medications lifelong. That's kind of what we know in the literature about outcome for now, but there's, Many unanswered questions in the literature. 
about epilepsy with island myoclonus since it's rare, since it's underdiagnosed, and since there's frequently a delay in diagnosis. And these many unanswered questions um, led to the project working with Cure Epilepsy over the past year and a half or so, because um, what I've summarized so far is pretty much what we know in the literature about epilepsy with island myoclonia. And so that's what uh, sparked this uh, this project that we had called Javon syndrome or epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, improving diagnosis and treatment through a modified Delphi consensus process. So the goals of this project um, were to try and establish standards to make an early and accurate diagnosis for patients so they don't have that um, diagnostic delay by almost 10 years. So we can um, educate people about distinguishing factors from other epilepsy syndromes, from other photosensitive epilepsies. So we can see what people throughout the world think are the optimal therapies to treat seizures in these patients. So we can try and characterize and understand the important comorbidities that come with this epilepsy syndrome. And so we could provide some recommendations for the evaluation, what workup to do, who should get genetic testing, things like that, and the management and the treatment for both children and adults with epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. With the hope that in the future, um, we'll be able to recognize these patients and maximize the potential for clinical trial involvement, especially as we're moving towards more epilepsy syndrome specific treatments um, and understanding genetics better. Um, but first, we really need to characterize things things appropriately. And so we use this modified Delphi methodology for this project that um, we started um, now almost two years ago. So this Delphi methodology was first developed in the 1950s by the Rand Corporation. And it's this rigorous consensus defining methodology that has actually been utilized in multiple areas of healthcare. Um, and so there's some good examples in the literature to kind of work off of, including in multiple areas uh, related to epilepsy. So Gervais syndrome diagnosis and management, there's been both a North American consensus and an international consensus. It's been used in other things like epilepsy syndrome definitions and then selection of epilepsy surgery candidates. And so how does this process work that we that we worked on over the past year? And so first, um, we identified a steering committee with international representation with the help of Cure Epilepsy. And this steering committee was our small working group um, of experts in epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. It involved physicians and patients and caregivers, so we had input from them about what's important. Um, this group came together. We split out the important um, topic areas of epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, and we went to the literature to summarize what was currently known, a lot of which I've already summarized in the earlier slides. And then we also worked to identify a larger group of experts, an international expert panel. Um, we, um, we actually nominated people and voted, and we wanted international representation. And then from there, we sent out our literature review to everyone on the International Expert Panel, and the steering committee also participated in three rounds of surveys. And each survey built on the prior um, results that we had received. For areas where the literature is pretty clear that this is consensus, this is known about the epilepsy syndrome, we made statements and asked for strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree. Um, we define consensus, because I'll talk a little bit about con consensus, as strong if 80% of um, physicians agreed or moderate if 67% agreed. And then we took all of the results, we summarized them, we tried to put things together in tables and in a format um, that could be helpful um, for kind of advancing this diagnosis and, and management of this diagnosis forward. And so who... Um, participated in our, our modified Delphi process. And so this table here shows that in total, um, we had uh, 25 um, participants. Um, no, sorry. Yes, we had, uh, we had mostly um, physicians seeing children, and then we had some seeing um, both adults and children. It was 25, and then we had patient and caregivers as well, uh, which were five in total. 
And then at the first survey, we ask um, both the physicians and the patient and caregivers how comfortable they felt with different areas associated with epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. And just I want to draw everyone's attention to the fact that physicians felt pretty comfortable with things like um, anti-seizure medications, genetic testing, EEG imaging, and clinical presentation, but there was just less knowledge about things like driving, neuromodulation, and dietary therapies, and our re results reflected that with areas where we could um, determine consensus. Um, and so from the results of this, we uh, put together this table about trying to evaluate patients who present where we suspect a diagnosis of epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. And there is consensus for many areas I've already kind of summarized, a childhood onset of epilepsy with a female predominance, typically a normal development, and frequent um, eyelid myoclonia. Which um, and they may also have other seizure types. We identified red flags being if patients had a severe intellectual disability or if they had other seizure types that we don't typically associate with epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, such as atonic or focal seizures. And if the clinical history um, and exam um, supported epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia to further evaluate, mostly with an EEG. A lot of times a routine EEG may be adequate. Um, and we had consensus for these abnormalities that we typically see on the EEG that we already kind of talked about, but that if there was background slowing or focal abnormalities on the EEG, that should be a red flag to consider an alternate diagnosis. Um, in MRI, there was agreement among our group that MRI was not required for a diagnosis, but if done, should be normal or show nonspecific changes. And that an abnormal MRI with a causative lesion, which may be something in the back of the head, an occipital lesion, should cause someone to uh, reconsider the diagnosis. And then genetic testing, we ask our panelists about genetic testing. And as I said, this was an international panel. And so there was a varying availability of different genetics. Um, and so not everyone had the same access to genetic testing. And so we had asked the panelists if every patient with epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia should have genetic testing. And we did not have consensus for that. But there was a consensus to either get an epilepsy gene panel or whole exome sequencing when one or a combination of factors was present, which was a family history, intellectual disability, or drug-resistant epilepsy. And then for treatment, one, I think, interesting area that we asked about was the goals of treatment. So I said island myoclonia can happen every day, can be hard to control with anti-seizure medications. And there was a strong consensus and agree, um, strong consensus from physicians and agreement from patients and caregivers that goals of treating the epilepsy syndrome would allow for accepting eyelid myoclonia as long as the other seizures are under control. Um, and that's taking into consideration a balance between anti-seizure medications and the eyelid myoclonia itself. And then we ask about multiple different um, anti-seizure medications, and there was a strong consensus for valproic acid, um, levetiracetam, and lamotrigine as, as first-line treatment with ethosuximide and clobazam for second-line treatment. And then there was just less knowledge about some of the other medications, so we had no other areas of anti-seizure medications uh, that had consensus. But we did have a consensus to avoid sodium channel blocking medications, except for lamotrigine, which does have some sodium channel um, properties, blocking properties. And then um, from our publications and our results from this, we put together multiple of these tables. I won't read everything on this table because that's um, kind of burdensome, um, but I will reference our publications at the end um, if people are interested. But I wanted to draw some attention to this topic, which is driving. So I said a lot of these patients have normal intellectual ability. Um, and they driving is so important for independence, um, especially in different areas in the United States where public transportation is not as available. And so we ask um, physicians, if patients have uncontrolled eyelid myoclonia, but they're not losing awareness, um, should they be advised to not drive? And there was no consensus, which was kind of interesting. But what we did get consensus for was that the physicians rely on the EEG to make um, recommendations about driving. And there's no great guidelines or consensus out there on how to use the EEG to make recommendations. Um, 
but we ask physicians, um, let me go back here, multiple scenarios, would you allow this patient to drive or not based on these changes on the EEG? And there were some variable responses with just few areas of moderate consensus, so even a normal routine interictal EEG. So I think this is another area that requires kind of further research and understanding of whether um, at what point it's safe for these patients to drive, um, a balance between, you know, safety and independence. And then we also had multiple questions about outcome information. That did not go to the right place. Um, so these bars look a little off. I'm not sure what happened. I apologize for that. But there was a few uh, things I thought were interesting. And so the first thing was that some patients actually may have a mild course that may never require anti-seizure medications. And there was a moderate consensus for that, which was interesting. Um, when we had our publication in 2018 of 30 patients, we had one patient um, who had a mild course that actually came off anti-seizure medications because the side effects were worse than the eyelid myoclonia. We did have a consensus that seizures are likely to persist into adulthood for patients, um, and that remission is um, happens in less than 50% of patients. Um, and then other interesting areas to highlight were that um, some things may be more associated with drug-resistant epilepsy, like early age of onset or intellectual disability. And I think we need more understanding to understand if these are the patients who are more likely to have a genetic mutation. Um, but there has been some publications that support this in the recent years. And then there was also a consensus about there being two phenotypes, so two different groups of patients with epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, one with an earlier onset, higher proportion of intellectual disability and drug resistance, and one with a later onset, normal intellectual ability and more drug responsiveness. And just a few kind of patient and uh, caregiver specific areas. So um, stress and sleep deprivation were noticed as triggers in all the patients and caregivers who responded. And I think it was also important to highlight that they um, all patient and caregivers thought that uncontrolled eyelid myoclonia can impact both social and psychological aspects of a person's life and can also be associated with bullying in the school and the work setting. So I think, um, even though there was a consensus to allow eyelid myoclonia, I think we need better treatments for the eyelid myoclonia because even if um, the seizures are um, not impairing awareness, they're still interfering with uh, patients' lives in significant ways. Um, and just a few highlights of some of the publications from this work uh, with our group over the past uh, year. We uh, published the review we had put together in epilepsy research. And then the modified Delphi process was recently published in two publications in epilepsy, um, which can be seen here that summarize all of the results in, in much more detail. Um, and then Cure Epilepsy has been taking the next steps to really advance uh, patient advocacy. There's currently no patient group for epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. I know they've been doing focus groups with patients and trying to build a, a patient um, advocacy community, uh, which I think would be great to move things forward for this um, diagnosis and management. And then we've also been we submitted things to conferences and doing different educational initiatives um, have this now on the NORD website um, to try and advance awareness about epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. Um, and so in conclusion, um, epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia is a rare generalized epilepsy syndrome, but the diagnosis is frequently delayed um, or misdiagnosed. It can, Epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia has a triad or three things we look for, which is the eyelid myoclonia, um, that the eye closure itself induces the seizures or the changes on the EEG, and then the photosensitivity. And typically we can diagnose this um, if it's recognized, if we uh, focus on the history and a routine EEG, and that eyelid myoclonia itself um, may be drug resistant and we need better treatments. And really um, our modified Delphi process found multiple areas of consensus, but also multiple areas where we may not know the ma best management choices and where if patients are likely to be drug resistant, even if um, we say these are the best meds to use, they may not be working. And so really further we work is needed in this area to advance the management of this um, diagnosis forward.
And I just want to give a huge uh, thank you to Cure Epilepsy, especially to Laura, who I've worked with closely over the past uh, year and a half or so. And then also to um, Dr. Whirl, who's here at Mayo Clinic that helped a lot with this modified Delphi process. And then to um, everyone um, listed here who was on our steering committee, um, who had, um, you know, significant input for the work we've we've worked on. And also want to thank our expert panel as well that, that helped us put all these results together. And my references, and then that's that's what I had. Terrific. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. That was really informative. Really appreciate uh, you describing that that important work. Um, so we'll now begin the Q and A portion. We have seven or eight minutes to address questions. Um, so if you want to submit a question, please feel free to put it into the Q and A tab and click send. Um, I already have a list of questions here we can start working on and we'll do our best to get through them um, and perhaps Dr. Smith can address them if we offline if we're not able to get to them sure. all. So, um, we've talked about the difficulty of controlling seizures in this epilepsy syndrome. Um, since it is hard to treat, what level of control should be expected and how do we know when to consider a new or an additional treatment or medication? I think that that, you know, that's a great question and it's a question that I think should be very individualized and depends on the patient itself. So if it depends what a patient's goals are, um, if a patient really wants to be driving, then I, we need to escalate or try to escalate therapy to the point where the patient isn't losing awareness where that could be safe. Um, and also, a, you know, a risk benefit ratio of trying a new anti seizure medication. Um, and so I try and just have a discussion with my patient um, to see and for us to agree on that, that difficult question. Yeah, okay. Does the VNS or DBS work for this syndrome? That's a great question. So um, there's limited data out there. In our series, we did have some patients who had VNS implanted um, from our 30 patients we published in 2018. I have personally seen some patients who've had some nice response to vagus nerve stimulation, but I would just say we don't have enough knowledge. Deep brain stimulation as well, there's even less knowledge on. There's um, actually one case report of responsive neurostimulation to the thalamus, which is similar to deep brain stimulation. Um, deep brain stimulation is advancing in areas of generalized epilepsy, but there's just um, not as much experience in generalized epilepsy, so that also includes epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. I, it's definitely an area of research and we should know more in the in the coming years. Great, thank you. So it's perplexing um, about lamotrigine. Um, in your talk, you talk about Lamotrigine works and be, can be prescribed, um, but sodium channels as a rule are not prescribed. So can you explain that dichotomy? Since sure, <laughs> I'll try. No, so and this is not just for epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia where there's this dichotomy. So we know that lamotrigine works for some generalized epilepsy syndromes. We use it in multiple generalized epilepsy syndromes. It can make myoclonic seizures worse. There's there's some good data for that, and there's some debate about the eyelid myoclonia being just myoclonus of the eyes, um, and so I think it's it's. But it also, we know, works usually well for the generalized tonic-clonic seizures in um, these uh, generalized epilepsy syndromes. And that's probably due to other properties than just the sodium channel blocking properties. Um, and so I think it's a bit of a balance. If a patient has a lot of extremity myoclonus, that's something to consider when starting the lamotrigine. Um, but we still typically, it's one of our go-to medicines for generalized epilepsies, despite its sodium channel. Part of its action being at the sodium channel. Okay, okay. that's helpful. I certainly need to understand more. Um, and along the same lines, in a way, there's a question Have combinations of medications been trialed for effectiveness against EEM? Um, this person um, has seen some better control during medication transitions mm. um, when there may be multiple meds on board. Is there any evidence for that? 
Um, you know, there's no great evidence for that. Most of the studies looking at epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia are retrospective studies, um, and it can be hard uh, when you look at some of that data for the confounding factors of multiple medications. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if there is sometimes a combination that works better um, balancing, you know, the myoclonus, the eyelid myoclonus and things like that, but we just don't have enough data to say. I would say there's a couple retrospective series that put some of the combinations together, but that data is, you know, limited and how to interpret it. Yeah. So there are some new medications available now. Are there any, um, is there any knowledge about how well Excopri might work? That's a good question. There was a series published actually out of Mayo by one of our, our fellows, Shruti Gagashe, looking at, uh, Excopri or Sonobamate and generalized epilepsies, and I believe there was one patient with epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia in that. So obviously very limited data. There are studies um, that are hoping, I, my understanding is to study Sonobamate or Excopri in generalized epilepsies, and we don't have the results from those in general, so I just don't think we have enough knowledge at this time. Okay, okay, great. So we are running short on time. I do want to make some um, the people have been asking about the availability of this video and our, our webinar. And yes, we will be sharing this this webinar on our website. Um, please give us a few days to get it um, um, packaged for um, sharing via our website, but it will be available for future viewing. Um, and there have been questions about the videos. There, the videos have been appreciated um, and questions about whether or not these can be made publicly available. In this webinar, we will not be making them publicly available, uh, but Cure Epilepsy is currently working on a video series that we can share with the public so that people can get a better understanding of what these look like um, in the clinical Condition. So stay tuned for more. We're hoping to have um, that information available um, later this year, as well as more educational uh, material available. Um, there are more questions, uh, and again, hopefully we can um, have Dr. Smith address those uh, at, a, at uh, offline, and we will post those along with the video content uh, in our in our website. So with that, I do want to wrap up and I want to thank Dr. Smith for your wonderful presentation and educating us on this topic. I'd also like to thank um, our amazing audience who always has wonderful questions and we're highly engaged and we appreciate uh, that very much. It makes these um, great fun um, to be able to educate such an interested audience. If you have additional questions about the topic or wish to learn about any of Cure Epilepsy's research programs or webinars, please visit our website or you can email us at research at cureepilepsy.org. I also want to let you know that we will be uh, releasing an announcement of our next webinar very soon. Um, it will be held on October 26 and it will focus on epilepsy surgery and how it can reduce the risk of sudden unexpected death in epilepsy or SUDEP and other causes of death in epilepsy. Um, that webinar will be in recognition of SUDEP Action Day, which also occurs in October. So with that, I'd like to wish everyone a happy and safe weekend. Uh, thank you for joining us again today. Um, be well.